that come through? Sure does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the new plan for this interview. Just, <laughs> no Hard talk, left turn. Yeah, no talking aloud this time. We're just, it's just going to be, here's, I'm going to place, I'm going to give you a musical question, like something like, and you give me a musical answer. Yeah. That's perfect. And then this is, this is me concurring. That's how the conversation will go. Yep. <laughs> oh, don't get me started. <laughs> okay. Don't get me started. Right. Well, but actually, this is this is an excellent way to start because really, Jenna, like I've been, I, I carry on hypothetical conversations with bagpipers in my brain pretty much constantly. <laughs> And my hypothetical conversation with you has been actually, I don't, I don't want this to sound weird in any way, but I've been carrying on a hypothetical conversation with you for like a couple years now, actually. <laughs> and and okay. the first question in this hypothetical conversation is, seriously, though, what if Watson were an organ? Right? So, yeah. Um, I'm not going to give you any more than that. That's where it starts. I see that. <laughs> I see that. What if Watson were an organ? So uh, you can tell me about that project if you'd like to. I do, I do want to hear you talk about it. I know you did an interview with like a local news station or something. I did watch that a while ago, but but tell me about yeah, that project because I, I thought it was really cool. I'll give you a little like elevator pitch on what mm -hmm. that piece was about. So um, this local uh, pipe organ electronics duo called Earthworld Collaborative approached me, and they they're always looking for new composers to work with to um, have pieces written for organ and electronics, because, like, how hard is it to find pieces already written for organ and electronics, you know? Yeah, a bit of a niche thing, right? No kidding. So, um, yeah, they approached me asking for a piece. I spent a good two years working on it. Which, how, like, but how did they I, know to approach you in the first place? Oh, um... You know how the music scene is like word of mouth um yeah. i was working in building pipe organs at the time really one of the yeah one of the guys working on the team at the company with me was doing an artist diploma at mcgill in organ performance at the time so he knew these other organists they were at mcgill they connected us yeah yeah it's, it's a small community in montreal so, well, yeah, I mean, you're talking to a bunch of bagpipers right now, and so I think there's probably, like, some sort of camaraderie of, like, you know, the small musical communities often spread out in diaspora, like how we connect exactly. to each other and stuff. But building exactly. pipe organs, I don't mean to, like, I asked you to talk about a thing, and now I'm distracting you from it, but that sounds amazing. <laughs> what was that job like? That was, as a music student, it's a dream job. It really is. Do you have to, like, assemble them completely, like, in-house to make sure they work, and then disassemble them to ship them i can't imagine yes. that the, the whole customer base is like in montreal right that's exactly it so actually like the company i worked for a company in virginia and i worked for a company here in montreal and both of them most of our clients are were in the bible belt in the u.s because oh, sure, that's yeah. where the demand that's and the money for organs yeah. is right yeah. so like even the company here in Montreal, we shipped organs to Texas. We shipped mm -hmm. organs to Virginia. Um, there's a couple here in Canada. There's one in Vancouver, but still they're all over the place. And like a big project will be, you know, two or three years for mm. 10 people's worth of work and a $2 million budget maybe. Yeah. Like, they're big projects. So, yeah, we build everything from scratch, everything except for the screws, basically, mm. from the ground up. It's all custom designed. Build it and assemble it in the shop and then have to disassemble it, ship it, rebuild it in the site. And then, like, then the fine tuning and the voicing comes in and all the, right, yeah. Yeah, the tweaking. Do you guys have, like, in-house tweakers? as it were who also like to travel <laughs> with the organ to like get it set up you know and to like do the tuning or would you like source that to an organ repairman in the in the area where it arrives um a bit of both it kind of depends yeah. on what comes up but if it's just some like basic tuning or some basic mechanical repair then yeah somebody locally can do it if it's if it needs like a major mechanical overhaul or i don't know maybe some custom parts replaced it depends on what 
is available locally in the shops if they have the setup to make, you know, if they have to make a replacement eight foot pipe, mm-hmm. it takes a big shop to do that, you know? Yeah, but I've seen, I, I, I haven't, I haven't been able to like go in behind the scenes for a lot of pipe organs, but I know that some of the stops say 32 foot. Is that really a 32 foot uh, it, pipe? Well, in some it is. In My some it goodness. is. My goodness. Yeah. That's yeah. insane. There's a flat um, trailer to deliver this <laughs> instrument. It's just amazing. <laughs> Not to mention so, like building an actual building to hold it once it arrives, right? Like how many of these churches have to like either be constructed to to make room for it or they have to like build an addition to the building for where to put this instrument. Or knock out a space behind Right, yeah. 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 Um like when you start crawling around inside the organs and getting to look behind the walls and everything, <laughs> yeah. you see some crazy stuff. Like I've seen, there's a really big cathedral in New York City that has true 32 foot pipes. Most mm-hmm. of them are capped, meaning they're stopped at 16 feet. And the pipe, when it's capped like that, it will sound a 32 foot length oh, sound I wave. See. I see. So there's like there's tricks and there's ways to do it. Um, but this one massive cathedral like, has room for 32 feet. But even then, the pipe, like the top of the pipe is actually made of this flexible hose that's just suspended across the ceiling because they couldn't fit it like <laughs> vertically all the way in the space. That's amazing. That's it's like hilarious. When you, use, um, you use like vinyl tubing to extend your drones on your bagpipes to get like a lower note. Right? It's like this <laughs> curly it. thing sticking It's up exactly the that. It's exactly <laughs> that on a massive scale. And so... Wow. Like looking at these pipes and there's these crazy things called Haskell pipes where like it's a pipe inside of a pipe. And so it ends oh. up being a much lower pitch than the pipe should play. And really? like I I still don't fully understand how stuff like that works. It's like this weird dark magic. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but if like if somebody had the knowledge or maybe I don't know if I got like a research grant or something for it. If somebody could apply that to bagpipes, oh, like man. just imagine the possibilities, yeah. you know? Oh, that's that's like literally dreaming last night. This is what was in my mind. Like there's this Australian bagpipe maker who makes, and, and like I think Nate Banton does the same thing. These like contrabass bass drones that are similar to like Illin pipe drones, you know, they get really, really yeah. low. And I just, I yeah. just dream of like how many drones could you fit into a stock? You know, could you get five, six in there? And what all could you <laughs> do with them, you know? And like add holes up and down the side of them so you can uncork them and stuff. Like... That's yes. Cool stuff. I mean, looking at the Lindsay system that's come out, oh, yeah, like yeah. that's very much how the Haskell principle works. There's like these hidden, you know, hidden length inside the pipe right. itself. Yeah, yeah. So, but if you, if you took that principle and like cranked it up to eleven, just imagine what we could do. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Man, this is too cool. Uh, I, I can already feel that like I'm gonna have a really hard time. Uh, sticking being too cohesive here, but that's not that doesn't matter, right? It's fine. I think okay. I think I'm probably I'm probably not way off in suspecting that just like there's a strange, maybe not strange, overlap of interest in accordions amongst bagpipers. I think that there's also a strong <laughs> interest in pipe organs. I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of the things are like kind of the same things. In fact, now I think of it, isn't it? Yeah, there there are even like double reed pipes in some organs, aren't there? Just like our chanters. Or am I thinking wrong? That's... Maybe that's not the case. A good question. I haven't seen. I don't like a, think like I've, I've seen I've, any I've, double reeds. Most I've seen of them single look like, for like sure. whistle fipples, right? Like there's like a, a cut yeah. into the pipe, and that's how it kind of whistles out, kind of. Yeah. So there's fipple mouth pipes that are called flute pipes, and there's reed pipes that are just a very simple resonator. Like it's basically a chanter with no holes, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But they'll okay. have a single reed, like a single tongue reed at the base of that. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. So more like yeah. more like one of our drone reeds, huh? Yeah. Exactly. Gotcha. gotcha. So yeah. a- anyway, we're Watson and Oregon. Tell me about that project. Sorry, Jenna. <laughs> pull you off so quickly there. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Oregon as we go along, especially to identify the sounds of hutchings and steers. Thank you. 
George Friedrich Handel. in an organ yeah the whole concept was well there was this uh computer made by ibm uh, i think in the 90s and it, it played I, chess right i feel like i remember or did it play did it, it do did it win at jeopardy once is that was that that's watching? it that was it yeah. that's it it's that computer like the whole point of it it was the first computer to just teach itself it was like the beginning of ai right mm -hmm. so they basically fed it the internet they just gave it some at first some restricted reign to you know memorize wikipedia and just ingest all this stuff and parse through it all and then eventually free reign to everything the internet at large and i looked at that and i thought well what if a musical instrument could do that what if a musical instrument had artificial intelligence and what would it look like inside this instruments computer brain to as it's churning through all this stuff and so i made this mashup also because i was like really starting to get into youtube at the time and looking at this mashup culture and um social media was still a bit young tiktok wasn't a thing or not a big thing at the time maybe and so looking at mashup culture looking at copyright infringement law and where are the boundaries where's the gray area on that yeah um and it's okay so long as you take an excerpt that's less than like eight seconds right okay so what if i make like a 10 minute piece out of nothing but eight second references to like 50 different pieces of music you know so it was a it was a lot of work but it was it was so much fun to just look at all these different ways i could juxtapose and mash together you know Bach on top of um I'm trying to remember my organ composers now um, oh you Bach can say on top of Huda yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on top of Liszt on top of, like just people from all across different eras of time and what's it like when they're just smashed together Did, did you ever watch the comedy, the comedic stylings of Victor Borga, the piano guy? I love Victor Borga. You, you know how you do that bit where he would like take sheets of music and like just cut them with scissors and like yes. like paste them to each other. It sounds like this is you know like he, he's doing the comedy version of exactly what this idea is, right? Like I'll oh, take a little bit of exactly. lich, take a little bit of you know, and I will play it as, as if it were Happy Birthday. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I, I grew up watching him, so there's probably a bit of that in the inspiration.
Um, any, so, so, so here's the other thing I was, I've, that's been running through my head for a long time now, Janet, that I wanted to, I feel like, uh, I thought, because of we're Watson and Oregon, I thought, Jenna's probably the perfect person to ask this. And I've tried Googling around and stuff. Have you, have you seen, like, like people do these, these things, like Netflix actually has done some, where they'll feed comedy specials to an AI and have the AI write the stand-up jokes, and they're just, hor- they're hilarious because they're so horrible. It's very, like, Adult Swim-style comedy, like, it's, it's just funny because it's stupid, you know? Um, I haven't seen it, but I, I love I would love that kind of thing. Oh, there's a really good one that I don't know who produced it, but somebody took a bunch of Bob Ross episodes and fed oh, yes. the joy of painting to an AI, and then the AI wrote an episode of the joy of painting, of joy of painting with Bob Ross, right? And and it was like mostly normal, but then like one of the colors that he had on his palette was called hot baby. <laughs> you know, it's like oh, there are these no. little things that come in that make you go, oh, okay, it's not a human, it's not a oh, human. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, like, I, I, all along I've been thinking to myself, like, what if I could feed an AI all of the Scots Guard books of tunes? And then I could go to the AI, you know, with, with tags, you know, so it knows this is a 6-8 march, this is a 2-4, this is a stress, oh, cool. you know, et cetera, right? And then I could go to it and say, I would like a four-part 6-8 march and just have it generate one, you know? Yeah. But how do I do that? I don't know how to do that, you know? <laughs> you have to well, translate it into bagpipe music writer format or something, you know, something that the AI can understand. There was a computer developed at Stanford University, I think, called EMI, E-M-I standing for Experiments in Musical Intelligence, oh. and it did, it's designed to do that. They just feed it sheet music, um, I'm not sure if they can just, if it can scan it and understand the sheet music, or if they have to turn it into some, you know, language it can understand, right. but the whole point yeah. is this computer can, like, break it down into the note duration patterns the way the melody moves all these idioms and if you feed it like 50 pieces by Chopin it'll spit out a new piece like perfectly in the style of Chopin right, right? Yeah. so I'm it's definitely doable and somebody hmm this was like 15 years ago but I spent a couple summer camps at the College of Piping and PEI did you really? S- That's so cool. Yeah. Have you ever gone? No. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful I there. Bet. It's such a it's a great way to just like detach from everything else and just focus on bagpiping, whether it's for a week or a month or some people go for a whole year, which would be a dream come true, right? Mm, yeah. Um anyway, so somebody there had a mashup of marches that like it was maybe half a bar to a bar of all these massed band marches that everybody knows. And when you're listening to it, you just had enough time to go, oh, that's Scotland the Brit. Oh, wait, now it's on to another one. Else. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. it's such a cool effect. Yeah. yeah, I would love to do something like that someday. Hmm. That is super cool. So so then, Jenna, where like... Tell me, tell me your story. Like, where does this all start? Because like, I've, I've explored your YouTube channel and you got other instruments in there. You've also got like... Not just we're Watson and Oregon. There are other pieces on here that are bagpipe specific that are like so obviously experimental, not only in the instrumentation, but also like, you know, you're messing with with what scale you're working with in the first place using using tape. You're you're you've got pretty complex rhythms going on. Like you you're a person who obviously uh, enjoys and respects the, the tradition, but also obviously has kind of a, you know, kind of a scatter scatter spread effect of, of of interests and stuff right so like where does it all start how'd you get started in music and where were all the twists and turns tell me your life story yeah well you touched on accordion earlier and uh it all started with weird al man <laughs> there was, yeah how many stories have begun this <laughs> way right <laughs> right <laughs> Um, yeah, growing up, I listened to a lot of Dr. Demento, I listened to a lot of Weird Al, and I think that just cemented my future as, like, a niche musician. <laughs> with, like... Dr. Demento was huge for me, too, Jen. I can yeah? definitely relate there, yeah. Before I even knew what it was, I was aware of the songs, you know? Like, I was, like, it was, like, a, a part of the air I was breathing from a very young age. Yeah. My, my baby brother sang fish heads as, like, part of his, like, <laughs> learning oh, no. to speak English as a little baby, you know? <laughs> yep! Oh, I still know all the words to that song, too. It's a good one. Even the rap part. Oh, that's part, scary. Italian sweaters and all that. That's impressive. <laughs> Drinking cappuccino. Yep. Uh, 
We are cut from the same the same wow. initial mold, Jenna. I understand you. <laughs> That's crazy. I bet we have a lot of stuff in common if we really get you down to it. You start there, you know. You can't help yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. But go so, on. Tell, tell me more. Yes. Yeah. Well, I like... When I was sort of thinking about what I wanted to talk about on this interview with you on mm. this podcast, I was like, okay, well, we're going to talk about bagpiping stuff. So I can talk about this. I can talk about that. And then I heard one of your interviews with somebody else and you guys got to talking about music theater. And oh, I was yeah. like, oh yeah, we have that in common. Yeah. When I was nine, I did like, um, I sang in Jesus Christ Superstar, you know? Hey, that's a big one. <laughs> that's a big show. That's a show so, that might have, may, maybe has never been allowed to play in Utah, where I live. <laughs> I mean, I've seen it like, on TV and video, right? But like never live. Yeah. I, I, I wonder if there are any school boards that would allow it even today. Yeah. It, yeah. Well, I was in San Diego at the time. So oh, well, that's the perfect place. We got away with all kinds of things, you know? <laughs> anyway, so... All that is to say, like, my backstory, I started with um, piano, a little bit of, like, very small musical theater just at my school, you know. Yeah. But, um, but where? I'm, ca I'm catching all kinds of geography. Where did you grow up, too? Yeah, I grew up in Carlsbad. Oh, uh, yeah. In California, just half an hour north of San Diego. So, I uh, started there. I took piano lessons uh, from the age of six, uh, got into choirs a little bit, but when I was... 11 we moved up to montreal so we immigrated my dad had a job up here so then we settled up here i got dual citizenship and everything um wait this is too per i i think of you as jenna bagpipes but isn't your last name denizen it is yeah you, and you are a denizen you're, why you're a denizen <laughs> I mean, of, Can of canada <laughs> i am <laughs> look at that that's amazing it's it was meant to be something you know? came full circle there at some yeah. point in the future, in the, in the past, I've got to imagine that one of your ancestors must have, like, been a denizen of some country, right? And so then, like, the last name carries on, and, and there you are, uh, immigrating yourself. There you go. And maybe I'll immigrate again. Who knows? Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm having a hard time not interrupting. <laughs> please please uh, carry on. So, uh, yeah, piano, choirs, Weird Al, Dr. Demento ended up in Montreal, and Montreal has such... There's such a, a value and emphasis put on heritage and culture, and the Scottish community here is just a great community. Mm. So then when I was 15, my parents took me on this road trip through the Maritimes, and the music in the Maritimes is incredible. Like um, Ashley McIsaac, uh, all the, uh, Natalie McMaster, like these amazing musicians come out of the Maritimes, right? Mm-hmm. So we were on this camping trip. I was kind of soaking up this culture, um, listening to Buddy Wes's name and the other fellers, which is sort of the Newfie That's version <laughs> of Weird Al, I yeah. guess you could say. Um, now, are, and, are the Maritimes, is that is that like Prince Edward Island kind of? I know it's it's east, right? It's eastern Canada. Eastern Canada, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, PEI. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Carry on. So lots of... I mean, Nova Scotia literally means New Scotland, right? There's lots right. of Celtic heritage. There's a lot of the Celtic music still very much alive. Kitchen parties, Kayleys, that kind of thing. That's the whole, uh, the Cape Breton flavor of, of piping is, is centered there, yeah? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we were driving through Cape Breton and we went to my first Highland Games. I was like 15. Oh. And I just looked at it and I was like, you know what? That looks like fun. I think I'm going to do that. And we bought a practice chanter and we got the College of Piping tutor book. Classic. And I just started teaching. Yeah, just started teaching myself in the back of the car for nothing else to do. Oh, great. And great road trip activity. And, and at that point, you're, you had picked up, the, you, you know, piano, choirs, all that kind of stuff. So it was like musical notation was relatively comfortable for you to read. You could, you could sit and look and figure it out. Yeah. So not notation was no problem. I didn't really play by ear yet, but with the choir that was starting to come together and bagpiping oh, yeah. really reinforced that. Mm. Piano, like, piano and bagpipes could not be more opposite, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I also started with piano and then eventually found my way to bagpipes. About the same age, actually. I think I was 14 when I picked up bagpipes. And, really? Yeah, definitely, definitely a different thing. How, what's your story? How did you come around to, you know, make that jump there? 
Oh, I was told from a very young age that I would play bagpipes. It was always expected. It was going to happen someday. My parents, I I get a bit hyperbolic about it perhaps, but my parents, at least one of the reasons they were attracted to the town where they bought a house when I was like three or four years old was that that town's high school had a bagpipe band. And so the intention was our kids will grow up here and learn to play bagpipes. And of seven kids, I'm still the only one. So I'm still their favorite. (laughs) Wow. It. Is that like, uh, do you get better Christmas presents? How does this, uh, does it get you any bonuses? I feel like it should. I, I, maybe I should take that up with my parents. I feel like they're, you know, I did, you, know what it get, you know what it gets me is they bought me a set of bagpipes when I was a teenager and those are still my pipes today. That's probably really yes! what it gets me is that they bought my My sweet 16. <laughs> I didn't get a car for my sweet 16. I got a set of pipes and that's what I still play today. There you go. So yes. much better. <laughs> So were you like uh, Nancy Drew learning the bagpipes, Where, by which I mean like by the time you were back home, you were already a pro, you could play Scots Wahey and everything and it was no problem? Oh gosh, no. No, I remember like my very first meeting with, uh, we found a teacher when we got back home, I think like a month later I had a first lesson with him and he said, okay, just show me the scale, show me whatever you know. He had a, a Scottish accent, I won't try to imitate it, but anyway, <laughs> it was really nice to listen to him teach. Um, very authentic. So he, yeah and so he said play me the scale and i played it thinking with my piano brain i played it from a to a and he was like you forgot low g Mm. (laughs) oh yeah anyway um it i remember trying to figure out scott's at the piano to figure out how it sounded oh yeah because i was still fumbling so much with the fingering on chanter but like trying to play a D throw on piano, and I was like, "This doesn't sound right," yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it took a long time to. I don't know. I mean, I was a quick learner because the the theory and the music notation was already there. But there's still the concepts of like playing a wind instrument, also music that has no rests. You just have to figure out where to breathe on your own. Right. Um, Concepts like crossing noises were totally foreign to me. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I'd imagine it probably throws everybody off when you first get onto the bag, too, and it's like you don't, like, if you try to breathe rhythmically, it's really going to screw you up. You, like, have to, like, disconnect your breathing from your playing. Maybe that's yeah. more a challenge for people who are really coming from like, a, like if they've been playing clarinet or trumpet or something like that for a while, especially, you know? But. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My, well, I teach full time now. Um, Bagpipes full time or do you teach other stuff too? Well, I was teaching piano just until last October, but uh, there were so many like course plans and pedagogies and mm-hmm. everything to keep track of. Now I've cut back to just teaching bagpiping full time. I was also promoted to director of the Montreal Piping and Drumming School last season. What? Yeah. That's pretty darn so, cool. So it's a nice feather in the cap. So what, what does that mean exactly? Is that school like something that uh is it like a, a full on school that includes a strong piping program or is it like, you know, uh like people go there, you know, just to learn piping and drumming kind of thing. <laughs> So it's an extracurricular thing. Right now it's just Thursday nights. Um, We have like five separate classes that happen every Thursday evening. Um, So we offer four different levels of chanter classes from absolute beginner to fourth year and as well as a piping class. So just getting people started from the ground up with the goal of supporting local bagpipe bands. So in those four years, they're supposed to get the fundamentals down and learn all their mass band tunes, get the basics of bagpipe technique down, and then off to a pipe band you go. And then you can send them out into the world to, to bolster the ranks of, of the various pipe bands. Exactly, exactly. That sounds really cool. For, for a little while here in Salt Lake City, there was a place, I think it was just called like the Celtic Arts Center or something, that in a similar way had like piping classes uh, and drumming classes and then also like highland dance classes or something like that right maybe they had like some penny whistle classes stuff like that too you know just like a place for instructors and students to all gather it doesn't exist anymore but you know i sure wish it did i need an eccentric millionaire to, to move, or well these days an eccentric billionaire to to move in you know and take interest in the in the celtic arts here that'd be cool oh yeah wouldn't that be nice <laughs> even better i need to become an eccentric billionaire i'd take it <laughs> <laughs> That's it. If we just we just have to win the lottery. That's all. That's I thought, all. I thought it was really funny. It comes to my mind a lot. I was talking to uh, my buddy Jeremy, who actually I think you might know Jeremy too via social media and stuff like that. He's the Wake yeah. and Twag guy. Yeah. Um, 
when when he got his job at at the university where he teaches now we were just talking back and forth about you know jobs and money and stuff like that and he said something that was so funny he said something like you know something like i recognize that like you know there's an immoral amount of money for one person to hoard and all that kind of stuff but the the punchline what he said was something like i think that i could probably be a really good rich person (laughs) (laughs) i'd be good at that yeah (laughs) like i would do really good things you know like i'd be really really good (laughs) (laughs) so what what about you though did you join a pipe band at some point there in your you know the second half of your teenage years or or did that never come into it or not till much later yeah yeah pretty quickly i joined uh i joined a local civilian band um Started taking lessons with a pipe major there. Uh, this was with the Montreal Pipes and Drums. Um, later, I became the pipe major of the band. I'm still active in sort of helping a little bit with admin and helping bring gigs to the band. Mm-hmm. So I'm still involved with them too. But trying to, yeah, trying to feed all the bands in Montreal and just support the community at large as best I can. Now that, now that I'm really free to focus on this full time and I'm as connected as, as I am in Montreal trying to really do good with it, you know? That's awesome. Yeah. Are there are there a lot of competitive pipe bands in Montreal proper or like between Montreal, Ottawa, what else is over there? Quebec. Like a lot of different bands that such that you could like have little competitions there and stuff just with the local groups or yeah, we do have uh, we do have the Montreal Highland Games, and we have competitions here. There's, I mean, everything's been turned upside down since the pandemic, so oh, sure. we're still yeah. sort of coming back to it. But I think what we're coming back to this year probably will be two competing bands in Montreal out of the for the four major pipe bands that will do parades in the greater Montreal mm. area. Mm-hmm. Plus, yeah, I joined the Glengarry Pipe Band, which they're in Maxville. So um, I do competitions with them and go out to their practices now. There's tons and tons of bands more towards the Toronto direction. I think there's more I Celtic descendants sense. down there than Quebec. Yeah. Do you feel like, well, I guess I don't really know is I, I, I guess I would have imagined that Toronto would be more, more densely populated too, but maybe that's not the case. Maybe Montreal. It is. Oh, it, it is. It is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. gotcha. Well, um, what, like what in the first place even got your family into Canada? Is there a history there or was their family up there? And also did, in your family, is there a history of musicality or are you the odd one out? No, I started piano because my mother plays piano. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, there's music there. There's never been a bagpiper or like a Highland musician of any kind in my family, though. Mm. So, um, it, like, my parents were really supportive <laughs> when I said, "Hey, you know, I want to take up this really loud and obnoxious instrument." Yeah, good parents. <laughs> yeah, yep. But that, they, that move from Carlsbad over to Montreal is also like one of the biggest geographical moves you could have made on the continent. I mean, I don't know, you could have gone from Florida to Alaska or something, right? But that's pretty far too. So, like, yeah. They were not only willing to, it's, I don't know, they, are your parents like very, very open to new experiences, like willing to let their child learn the bagpipes and also willing to like go so far away from where they had been living? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, my dad's job, uh, he's retired now, but he traveled a lot. He was uh, an aerospace contractor. So that's what brought us up here. Mm-hmm. He got a job with um, the company Bombardier, uh, Bombardier. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, y'all Canadians with your French, go on, <laughs> show it off. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what brought us up here, and then the the job that contract stuck for a while, so we settled here, and um, he, I mean, he ended up working in other places like Baltimore and Belgium. After that, he still moved around a little bit, but our home base has been Montreal for a long time. And actually, my folks are back in Arizona now. They retired oh, back they? where the weather is is sensible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, down toward Arizona. That's a that's a direction folks like to head when they retire. That's for sure. Um, yeah. It just it seems to me like even even like even the, uh, a willingness to turn on something like Doctor Demento, it it just it speaks to like a a certain like. Oh, kind of maybe kind of a loose hold on the seriousness of life, like willing to let things be fun, you know, and stuff like that, that like, I don't know, I just something I enjoy is just like imagining what what are all the elements that went into the soup, you know, to make this like this like uh, this sort of like uh, the milieu 
if I may also use a French word, uh, from, from <laughs> which the person I'm talking to came, you know, like what all went together to make, you know, you who you are today, you know, all of the conditions and stuff that made it possible for that to happen. Yeah, well, let me turn that back around, because what what do you think it takes to make us like to give a kid permission to be so counterculture and just be weird i mean it's you know when you're in a pipe band it's not counterculture you're doing what the other people yeah, around totally. you are doing but when you like uh one of my favorite memories was i was 15 i had oh no i was 16 i had just gotten my set of pipes like maybe a few months before but i had to give a french class oral presentation and for some reason like having a set of bagpipes when i was i was a very shy teenager and French classes, having moved up here from California and being behind on mm. the French language and everything, um, it, bagpipes became this like superhero cape I could put on, you know? Yeah. I struggled with public speaking. I struggled with like, you know, uh, just kind of social anxiety and especially being embarrassed that my French accent was very bad at the time and mm. so having to give a french oral presentation i was like i'm gonna bring my bagpipes and use them for the presentation and yeah. that seemed like a great <laughs> idea i think my french teacher was less than thrilled but you know the other students in my class thought it was funny as long as you call it what corn amuse is what they call it right corn, right corn, yeah. right so as long as you use that then it, it's french so it yeah counts. <laughs> it counts yeah so what do you like what do you think it I don't know. takes to give a kid it's, that i think that is really that it, it is a really interesting thing where like i i myself my, my oldest child is 11 years old right now and it's something he's like on the cusp of what can be the most awesome at least in my memory some of the most awesome years of childhood but also it can be some of the most painful you know terrifying and stressful years of childhood going into teenagerhood you know and uh and, and it's so it's something that's been on my mind for a while here because like like what things what like there were times in my own childhood where like all I wanted to do was was blend in you know and you know I wanted it could be something as trivial as like a hairstyle or something like that you know but then like what why did some things seem cool to be different you know what I mean and yeah. there's even like that weird thing where it's like I think I'm being different but I'm actually being the same as all my friends were being different together you know what mm -hmm. I mean Mm -hmm. And and I I really don't know what the secret sauce is, you know what? Because like I want my child, my children, all of them, to to be able to like feel confident in that they're doing what they like to do, whatever that is, whether it's popular. Like if it's popular, they're still doing it because they love it, and if it's not popular, they're still doing it because they love it. You know what I mean? But I don't That's know how beautiful. to provide that to them. You know, like like proactively. You know, like can you like is that a thing you can do, or does it just happen by magic? I don't know. <laughs> hmm. Well, that's beautiful. And I guess, like, if I think back to my, you know, how I came around to the pipes and why I chose it, I think the timing was everything. Mm. Um, like, my parents really exposed me to tons of stuff. They took me to lots of concerts. They took me to lots of just, you know... Uh, museums or parades or activities, this, that, and the other, exposing, exposing to all kinds of cultures and opportunities and just options to see what's out there. And I think it just happened that, like, when I was at that age, I was looking for that identity and what made me different mm. and the family heritage tied into that. Mm. So then bagpiping was, like, weird enough that it fit with me, but... Yeah, the timing, I think timing was a big part of it. That's an interesting point. Yeah, like um, if you're like ready ready for that superhero cape, that thing that would make you a little bit different maybe. Is the part That's of it. it. That's it. Yeah, I think it's interesting too. I don't have any sort of like empirical data, empirical data or anything like that, right? But just like, just just from talking to people, it's you, you mentioned that you were kind of shy, you know? I don't feel like mm -hmm. that's an uncommon experience. And maybe that's like... Maybe it's part of the human experience that all of us are going through a, a period of shyness at some point. But I wonder, like, how much does something that's, like, kind of weird and pretty darn loud, like the bagpipes, you know, like, really appeal to somebody who maybe is a little shy? And, like, it, I begin to suspect that we might actually have a large cohort of, you know, shy people <laughs> playing bagpipes. <laughs> hmm. You know what I mean? I love it. It's That would make sense to me. And it's... 
like the piping community, the people who are playing my pipes now has changed so much compared to like a hundred years ago, right? What, you mean like because girls can play now? Well, because <laughs> girls can play, but also the fact that it was such a military dominated yeah, instrument. And yeah. so it, the stereotype wasn't this shy person. It was very much like kind of the macho tough guy yeah. thing to do, right? Yeah. Um, it's but... A- yeah, go ahead. The the you you mentioned you know going out there to the to, to the to the eastern you know the eastern throws of Canada and you know the piping scene out there and stuff like that. It's it's precisely Barry Shears, um, that like via you know our mutual friend Jeremy. That it's only through him that I know about Barry Shears and it, but it's precisely his work, and, well and Matt Seattle and some others too. That like I've only I've only in the last few years begun to become aware that like there was piping pre military tradition. Mm-hmm. You know, and like, I, I'm not saying that the, uh, like, sometimes I do say things about like our strict rules about competition and stuff like that, that I actually regret later. Um, JD Ingram, who does the voice of the, uh, the, the weekly drone on, on the big rab show recently, I thought put together like a really poignant, lovely description of why, like, it's okay to have competition and like competition presents unique, uh, uh, challenges and, you know, being creative within the rules is like part of, part of it, you know, and stuff like that, like. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm spread all over the place here. But what I'm trying to say is that, like, I I only recently became aware that, like, there's other piping traditions outside of the MSR and the military tradition, you know, like kitchen piping. And, and it's not just small pipes either, like Highland pipes. Well, li- even like the high B thing, right? Like, I thought yep. the high B, playing a high B on, on a Highland bagpipe chanter, I was like, whoa, what is this crazy new innovation, right? And then Jeremy's talking about how, like, Pipe makers in Eastern Canada used to put a notch through the high A hole precisely for this. So you had a spot to stick your thumb. It's like, that was a thing. And it's almost like, I feel like maybe I was just unaware of it, but it's like, we collectively have forgot it for a while. We're like rediscovering some, some, you know, ancient root in a way, you know? Wow. No, I hadn't heard about that notch, but that's, oh, yeah. I mean, it blew this my high B I thing. Like, what? Yeah, this high B thing is new to me. Like, yeah, new to me too. I mean, for sure. you and Jeremy have been a big part of my inspiration lately. For like, okay, what else can the chanter do? Like, I've been I've been so itching for a long time for, you know, a different type of chanter or something with some more mm, possibilities. Jenna, like, w- w- would you say you've had itchy fingers? Oh, but um. <laughs> <laughs> witchy itchy fingers maybe hey there we go yeah um just a little nod to your bagpipe swag store i appreciate Not it that thank I'm, you kindly yeah i'm sure your listeners already know all about it but. i hope so i sure talk about it a lot <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i've been so itching for like uh like the the chanter only nine notes it's so limited right and when you're coming from piano when you're coming from an instrument that has 88 88 notes (laughs) and dynamics you can play at different volume levels like these things is you're so hungry for them when you play bagpipes but then yeah like uh you're the new chanter that you're talking about or hearing about these high B things, it's like, okay, there's, there's ways to do this. Yeah. This, yeah. Maybe this can work. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mean to like bag on, on tradition in any way. Like it's, it's an amazing thing. And uh, if nothing else, I, I often think about how it's like, it's an amazing like time capsule, you know, like how much would be lost if we didn't have strict rules for competition and stuff like that, you know, mm-hmm. but you know, if you only have one thing, you don't know about the other things. And when you find about the other things, it kind of blows your mind and it's exciting, you know, that's it. Well, I think, you know, we'd need both. We need the yeah. old and we need the new. And it's so like, it's so important to have people like Jeremy who are going through all these old tunes and just like doing the research, doing the documentation. And I, as a composer, um, you know, I have a terrible brain for history, I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. And I'm so motivated to do stuff that's new. And it's, I think we're long overdue for, um, yeah, some really weird bagpipe music long overdue for some weird stuff amen i'm with you there. yeah <laughs> yeah i, I, I don't really know if you've uh, too. uh it, like his the hours that he puts into that podcast and i just get to sit back and soak it in i feel i feel almost guilty about how much work one person is doing and i just get to take all the cream off the top for my own enjoyment you know <laughs> but sorry go on you I, I interrupted you there 
Well, I don't know if you've listened to like um, some of the people that are doing really new, really creative stuff with pipes these days. Jordan Alexander Key is a piper in Florida, I believe, who wrote a microtonal peabrock. No, I'm Googling right now. Yeah. What was his it, last name? Keys? Key. Key, uh, Key. K-E-Y. Yeah. So his piece is definitely worth listening to. Um, what else? Julia Wolf has a couple of really weird pieces. Weird in a good way, obviously. I'm embracing the word weird here. Absolutely. Um, it's And it's very textural. Like, it's not about the melody. It's just about using the striking of the drones as this long minimalist texture mm. or chanter slides um like bending slurring up the chanter as a texture um what else even corn even the metal band corn they do some really interesting stuff with like the digital min- manipulation of the sound and mm. looping mm-hmm. yeah I've got I've got Jordan Alexander's thing pulled up. I'm going to check it out after the interview for sure. Have you yeah. have you, you know that uh, Doctor Bagpipe guy? Uh, yeah, Matthew Welch. Yeah, Matthew Welch. He just put out he put out well just barely I don't know was that a year ago I, I can't remember now but he put out his uh his like his thesis that he'd written in, in book form. It's yeah. Kale Kale New did he, is that what he called it Kale Nevu Kale Novu. Anyway, um, it just I, I I I should not pretend to understand a lot of what he wrote in that book because a lot of it really does feel like a little bit beyond me like i need to i need to give that book another two or three times through before i start grasping all of it but it it just feels like he's speaking to a lot of the same things that like um you know there's there's more here there's some untapped potential here we can we can dig deeper and find more stuff oh absolutely and and when you think of it feel like like if you don't mess around you never find out so we all got to mess around you know like let's (laughs) let's mess around guys (laughs) yes yeah exactly let's do something dissonant not everything has to be you know (laughs) Yeah. Consonant and perfectly in tune, I think. It's that's also like it can be um very intimidating, you know, to step outside the bounds, but it also can be really, really freeing because and like maybe this is just me being selfish about it, right? But like it thing it, it occurs to me that like, well, if I'm gonna if I if I say I'm gonna do something experimental and then my drones aren't perfectly in tune, I could just be like, Yeah, that's part of the experiment, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Anything goes. I'm making the rules. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Jenna, who do you who do you think now that you've been playing for a while and like you you performed a lot and stuff like that and you you know you're putting stuff on YouTube, um, but you, you know your family's been there for the for the whole journey and everything like that. Right now, who do you think is your biggest fan? Who who do you think like would get most excited if you got out your pipes? They go like, oh yeah, I'm so excited to hear from you. Whoa, um, that's a tough question. We should probably all acknowledge that uh, most mothers would feel bad if you don't say your mom. But that, <laughs> well, yeah. we, we could take that off the table. We could say, obviously, your mom is your biggest fan. Obviously, now, my aside mom. aside from your mom, who yeah. else do you think really loves hearing you play? Um, and you can swallow all pride at this point, right? You don't have to pretend like, you know, well, well, by which I mean, like, you don't have to, you can say anything and it, we won't, it won't come across as prideful because I'm asking you, who likes hearing you play? You know what I mean? Um, it's. Honestly, like, I'm thinking of, there's, like, 10 or 20 people who've really just, since I started going online and becoming more public with piping and focusing on it more full-time, there's these people who have just been, like, the sweetest supporters Mm -hmm. and the kind of people that subscribe to my Patreon. Some of them are students, some of them are, like, um the the legion manager who makes our band practices possible she's just like the sweetest or um the students at the piping school my private students like it's so it's so touching when i can tell that they they get it and they value they really value what i do and they believe in they just believe in piping you know Mm -hmm. they believe in the creativity and I can tell that they're willing to support on my Patreon, whatever, whatever whack of cockamamie ideas I have next. And, they, and you've like, had a few. They've been, yeah. it's been a lot of fun. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's a great chance to, to like, tell me about that. Your system, if I, if I'm understanding it right from watching some of the YouTube videos, it's something like you, uh, like 
uh, people can sponsor a playthrough, like a tune explanation with transcription and here's how to play it kind of thing. And that will become public. But also like some of your videos you put out, you'll have like sheet music for them uh, available to patrons. That kind of is that kind of the model? Tell, tell me all about it, how your how your business runs it pr at present. Yeah. So I do a lot of different things. I um, mostly teaching privately, also available for hire for performing, but the online part of my business, I'll record tutorials on commission. I'll make transcriptions for my patrons. Um, I make little extra bonus material available to my subscribers on Patreon especially stuff that I use for my students. If I see, oh, you know, um, most of my students are struggling with this thing. I notice there's something missing from bagpipe pedagogy, or this is just a common problem that comes up. I'll make some exercises, uh, for example, like just technique exercises for getting more comfortable playing notes while squeezing the bag and getting more fluent with that breathing detachment, like you mm. mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, so stuff like that I'll make available on my Patreon and I'll make available to my students extra, like I do a lot of private YouTube recordings that I don't put out publicly, but they're demonstrations of, you know, how to play this grace note or how to do mm -hmm. this rhythmic thing. Is, is most of your, are most of your private students online or do you have a lot of in-person students too? Mostly in person, actually. Oh, right on. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I'd imagine that's got to be an easier way to teach and learn for both parties. And so it's great that you have enough people there locally that, you know, that that's the thing. Yeah. Well, and it's so amazing how much the online world has exploded and become much more accessible since the pandemic, too, that yeah. we can offer online lessons. Because a couple of my students live in rural areas and they can't get teachers locally, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's super cool. Now, now if you were... Um, like, I don't want you to feel like you're under, under any pressure here or anything like that, but has there ever been a thought given toward potentially producing, like, uh, listenable... Well, not that, not that the stuff you put out isn't listenable. I didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> I just mean an album. That's all I'm trying to get at. Have you ever thought about putting out an album, uh, be it of, of covers, originals, experiments, etc.? By listenable, I just meant, like, in the format of a CD kind of thing. <laughs> you know... <laughs> It's like all of this stuff you've done so far is fine, Jenna, but could you do something that's <laughs> listenable? <laughs> well, I don't know if you heard the versions of Scotland the Brave I put out recently, I sure but did, I wasn't yeah. going for listenable, you no, know. No, I, I, I like that. Man. I like flatten those notes. Heck yeah. <laughs> um, I, the problem is I have too many ideas. Like there's a lot of stuff I want to do. Yeah. Um, definitely putting out an album is, a, is an idea on the back burner. Putting out a uh, collection of sheet music is an idea on the back oh, burner yeah. Yeah. yeah it's i'm still kind of spitballing and seeing what catches on yeah, what sure. people want what kinds of pieces land and also at the same time when it's stuff that's just creative for me i kind of like that it isn't monetized on youtube or monetized on spotify because then I'm really just doing it for me. Yeah. The the really weird stuff, I'm it's separate. It's kind of it's kind of sacred and I'm not expecting anything back from it whereas you know, transcriptions of a pop song, yeah, I'll monetize that stuff because that's not, you know, I'm not putting my my soul into that stuff. But maybe yeah, maybe someday if I get enough um original pieces built up, if I get enough uh enough transcriptions done i'll publish some stuff another dream i have actually is uh like i teach out of my home right now but someday i'd like to get a studio that's just you know the place where i teach and mm. also make it a hangout so that scottish musicians in the montreal area can have jam sessions there and oh heck yeah yeah, I mean, all that is to say, there's tons of ideas. There's always tons of stuff in the pipeline. Yeah. Well, I feel like, you know, not that not that I'm the arbiter of what an artist can or can't do, but I do feel like I've encountered artists, you know, that, like, sometimes you have a project where you go, I'm going to write this tune book, you know, but then at other times, it's like over the course of, you know, a decade of just doing your thing, 
suddenly you look around and you realize, oh, I've got enough like disparate pieces of music here. If I just pull them together into a binder, it's a tune book. Oh, oh well, there we go. I've got a tune book, you know? Uh, yeah. Shoot, who knows yeah. how? Who, who knows how the spaghetti's going to stick to the wall, right? Exactly. That's that's the best thing about where social media is at these days is you can do these little micro pieces, just mm -hmm. thirty seconds, even just fifteen seconds of a little snippet of a tune, a little video of this, and just test it out and see how it lands. Yeah, uh, totally. So, do you do you find time to? like I'm saying this with air quotes practice, like where you just get to just sit down and work on something for yourself. Or is it more like the development of your playing at this point happens like in action while you're teaching other people or working on a video, et cetera. It's a bit of both. I mm. think, um, I, d I do make time to practice for sure. Yeah. Something I've noticed with teaching is if I don't have, um, if I don't have any new material coming in to my brain, it's really hard to be giving it back hmm. and putting information out, if you know what I mean. Totally. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It, it seems to me like, like for a lot of us, if we get stale with our playing, then yeah, our teaching, like it's all, maybe at least one aspect of that is that we kind of forget what it's like to learn something new. And so then we're kind of out of touch with the student because we're, we, we've been coasting for so long. We're not learning new things ourselves. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It gets stale. It gets, gets imbalanced. And I mean, that's why I joined a competition band to keep myself, you know, driven and challenged and playing with other people that really, yeah, challenge me as a player and are giving me new food for thought on like mm. this way to play a stress bay or this type of slow air. Mm. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Well, what about, so when you do play though, like what's your situation like with your neighbors? Do they, do they know you as that's the bagpipe <laughs> house over there? You know, like, do you have any neighbors that go running inside when they see you come out into the yard? Or yeah, <laughs> you <do>? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so Montreal is like a fairly dense, city it's yeah. um i don't know what are we two and a half million people maybe now and i live in a condo building and my neighbors are so patient yeah. <laughs> have you invested They're in like an gracious. electronic bagpipe or something to give them a break uh no <laughs> <laughs> not even not even they're really gracious and i uh you know i remind them that it's so appreciated because it's not just me it's also my students and yeah. you know new pipers making squeaks and squawks and that's just part of the game yeah. um but my neighbors are totally cool with it and um this past summer like my neighbor it was his birthday i went to play happy birthday outside of his place but do you know the game Pokemon Go? Oh, for sure, yeah. Yeah, so I also play that game, and I'm in, like, a Facebook group for the lo local players. And I didn't know it, but one of the other Go players in that group lives just upstairs from this guy. Oh, really? <laughs> and so I play him Happy Birthday, and it's just, like, a quick, you know, 30 seconds in and out. And then later I see on the Facebook message group for the game... Hey, the bagpipe lady is playing outside my window again. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get on there and be like, how annoying. I hate it when bagpipes do that. <laughs> I had a no, bagpipe people... lady living near me once. It was the worst. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, part of the Montreal culture is that people are really appreciative of just like weird performance art stuff yeah. like that. Like there's a big circus culture here. And so... I think that's part of it. Um, people think it's really cool if they're walking down the street and they see this thing they've never seen before and they're really curious and they're really interested and it starts all kind of interesting conversations. Um, but I've also learned to be really respectful of not practicing in the same place all the time. Oh uh, yeah, kind of set up yeah. a rotation. Yeah, I set up a rotation. I have a, a regular place at a local park that I'll go practice in that's like, far enough away from people I know I'm not going to bother the you know people who live right across the street kind of thing yeah yeah there was um I think it was a really great piece of wisdom that came to us from the infamous El Chapo 
um, down here on the United States southern border. Some, something, the, a theory that goes something like, don't poop where you sleep. <laughs> yep. Yep. So think about who you want to keep happy and go go make your noise somewhere else, right? Yep. <laughs> yep. What about you? Do you live in the city? Uh, I mean, I do in as far as like, quote unquote, city goes in Utah County, Utah, like the entire county has like m- maybe 650,000 people in in the whole county. And I live in one of the most densely populated parts of the county, but it's, you know, it's it's a it's a it's it's pretty spread out uh it's it's easy to be away from people very very quickly so nice i I, I haven't had any problems that i know of yet with neighbors though i've also been living here for like a decade and i have had the neighbors on the one side of our house that house has changed owners three times so maybe that's a factor i don't know (laughs) nobody else has left the neighborhood but they they have several times now so i don't know actually for a little while my good friend kevin was renting my basement from my wife and i he and his wife were renting our, our basement and he plays bagpipes too and at the time we had another friend who was living just two blocks away who also played bagpipes so we had a really intense period in the neighborhood of bagpipers um for a couple years there oh that's a lot yeah yeah, maybe even a lot for us because like <laughs> it was like sometimes I'd be playing my pipes out in the backyard and Kevin would come out and he'd be, you know, somewhat jokingly because, of course, we're friends, you know, but he'd also be like, hey, if you're going to play him, could you at least tune your drones? <laughs> or he'd come well, over and he'd just walk up and not say a word and just tune my drone for, you know, like just move my middle oh. tenor a little bit for me and then Ouch. go back inside. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> well, and it's hard enough playing an instrument that when you practice you know people can hear you yeah yeah it's not like you can get it ready and then present it to the public <laughs> it's all <Yeah>. public. <laughs> and when you practice you just want to be free to make mistakes and yeah. not be heard right and then on top of that if you know a piper is listening to you oh it's Isn't even that worse the most stressful thing in the world oh like, i know when, when I, whenever i play any gig i'm just like that is the thing that's foremost in my mind is like how many like incognito pipers will there be, you know, in the crowd? And those are the people who I'm playing for, really. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or like competitions when you're oh, final yeah. tuning in front of the judge. And, oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, this is this is a little bit uh, off the bat, but I, I, I am curious, like genuinely curious. Does pineapple as a pizza topping get up there into eastern Canada or is that not much of a thing up there? <laughs> no, we have Hawaiian pizza up here. Yeah, you do. huh? It's a but, thing. But is what, what, maybe this is a really tired joke. But like, seriously, though, Canadian bacon is that do you just call it ham or what? What do you what do you do with Canadian bacon up there? That's not a thing here. That's like fried egg rolls. It's I mean, not in Quebec anyway. We don't have a different kind of bacon. <laughs> but like, because I know that like I'm, when I watch the Great British Baking Show or the the Bake Off, as they would call it across the pond right. there, right? Um, they talk about stripy bacon, which uh. from what I understand is what I would call bacon. But then I have this word Canadian bacon that by which I really just mean like ham chopped up tiny. I don't know why it's called that here, you know, but like it's like if you're making a Hawaiian pizza, are you putting is it do they say pineapple and ham? <laughs> or do they say pineapple and Canadian bacon? <laughs> right. Well, here they say pineapple and Canadian bacon, right? But like, what are they really? Yeah, do they? Do they? They do. Yeah. Uh, no. I honestly, I haven't heard the terms Canadian bacon since I moved here. Look at <laughs> it's, that. It's just pineapple and ham. Yeah. Speaking speaking of ignorance about Canada, here's something, Jenna, that has just been like constantly on my mind. Are are you are you familiar with the the Great White North, that comedy show that was running in the eighties? It, it eventually um, led to the movie Strange Brew. That's 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 what more people know is the movie Strange Brew. It's Bob and Doug McKenzie. Yeah, yeah, they were on SNL for a while, no? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think they voiced the either they either those actors voiced the Moose Brothers in the movie Brother Bear, or they definitely modeled the Moose Brothers after those two actors for sure. Like it's definitely like a thing that's present in culture in like pop culture, right? Is is Bob and Doug McKenzie? They had this. It was this show called The Great White North. It was like this mock talk show where they would like be very stereo very stereotypical canadians with like wild canadian accents you know just like talking about hockey and beer uh basically so and no do to boot it and that kind of thing exactly no do to boot (laughs) it all that you know um and so here's the thing my wife my wife's friend had some canadian friends who no my wife's cousin brought some canadian friends to like a family sunday dinner one night 
And I thought, surely, surely Bob and Doug McKenzie are like Canadian national treasures. You know, <laughs> I love that show. That was hilarious. You know, I, I was like, surely this is a known thing, right? And so they were talking about where they were from. I think they were from Quebec. I'm not totally sure now. Honestly, it's been a minute. But I said, I just said something like, ah, down from the great white north, huh? The the poisonous glares that I got from these people. <laughs> And they were, it was like, it's not all white all the time. We have seasons. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I just turned and went back to the hors d'oeuvres table. You know, like I, I didn't know what to do from there. So uh, did I commit a serious faux pas? Did, is it true? Did, is it really a, like, do you never hear anybody reference Bob and Doug McKenzie up there in Canada? Was I completely or am I just like decades off from what actually is? Maybe that's the problem, right? Maybe my my, my uh, pop culture references are too old. <laughs> Maybe that's all it really is. Well, and you thought Canadians were nice. <laughs> yeah. Gee, I thought, they would, <laughs> I thought they'd just chuckle even if it wasn't funny. Even if it's wildly offensive, they'd still laugh and be nice about it, right? <laughs> and apologize. Sorry. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, tell me sorry themselves, yeah. Um, I, did, I don't think it's offensive. I don't... Um, I need you to weigh in for all Canadians and make me feel yeah, better about myself. <laughs> really, really, I, I don't. I mean, people have pretty much forgotten about it up here. It was never. I mean, SNL is not a Canadian show. It was never a super Canadian thing, to my knowledge. But again, like I moved here after that era. I mean, yeah, Red yeah. Green is a good example of oh, a Green. Canadian gem heritage export thing. I read. I. Red Green really is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, probably... Uh, I, I hope that the brothers, Bob and Doug McKenzie, aren't listening to the show right now. And I suspect they <laughs> probably are. What are the chances? <laughs> <laughs> but I think if I had to choose, Red Green would definitely be my favorite. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times as a child I heard my, my dad say, I'm a man, but I can change. But I can change. If I have if to. If I have to. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Okay, wait, That's Jenna, great. I wanted to talk to you more about bagpipes. What is a tune that for you is evergreen? Something that you've been playing since you started and it's never got old or stale for you. You still just love that tune. Mm, Trees of North Uist. I don't know that one. Mm. It's pull that a 6-8 march. It's a four-parted 6-8 march. Okay. Uh, I like the tunes that are in minor the little bit darker stuff mm. and this one's one of the really rare ones that's in e minor or e dorian technically so yeah just gorgeous melody trees of what was it again north uist like as in the fred morrison tune uh leaving uist yes gotcha yeah. oh i'm gonna pull that one up and check it out yeah beautiful tune and i googled it eventually Northwest is an island with no trees, as it turns out. So interesting. I don't. Yeah, I don't know if the title is ironic or if maybe there were trees there once upon a time. Uh, that's where the Entwives were. That's, <laughs> that's it. That's maybe Jeremy be. would know something more about that. I don't know. Okay, now I feel silly because I see that this was in a set on the um, the Live from Down Under album that Simon Fraser University did. Oh, really? So I have heard it. I just didn't know it by that name. But I, I oh, I didn't know that. Think what it was. So I'm gonna I'm gonna dive into that. What about what about on the other end of the spectrum? Are there any tunes that at this point for you personally you could just do without? You never want to play them again. Yeah, I'd say Scott and the Brave is up there. I could do without it. Yeah. Um, I the thing about that is, as a performer and somebody who does a lot of ceremonies of all kinds, I want to give the the client give the ceremony what they want and do a good service of course you know? yeah and do what's appropriate to the occasion so a lot of the time scott and the brave is what's asked for scott and the brave is what's appropriate and i get that but you know artistically mm, could do without it yeah mm, it's having, been done having played it so many times of course right that's it and some of those tunes like they kind of come and go too right like maybe maybe 10 years from now you'll be like ah i'm like rediscovering my love for scott and the brave who knows maybe it could happen uh, maybe. maybe not <laughs> maybe not the the one tune that's always been a pet peeve though like i didn't like it from the beginning is green hills of tyrol oh interesting interesting yeah you do you like it i i mean like i feel totally neutral about it you know yeah. like, having played it so many times in parades and stuff like that it's it's one of those you know five or six tunes that like i think my fingers could play it and my brain could go somewhere else you know yeah 
Mm-hmm. But uh, is that actually no? I get it. I get it mixed up with Barren Rocks if I don't have a Chantry in my hand. Is it the one that's in three four, or do I, do I have that flip around? That's the thing. It's in three four. Da 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 da. But like. You can the dig melody... into that grip and throw at the beginning of that. That can be kind of fun. <laughs> Just, uh, really I mean, when you're in mass bands, just grips on every single note. That's right, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> why not? I'm the percussion section now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it th- Like, the thing about it being a 3-4 is the melody doesn't always suggest 3-4. Ah, uh, yeah. And the drum score kind of sounds like a 2-4. It just... Yeah. Uh, yeah that, musically, that sure, it's yeah. really weird. It, it's It feels weird. like when you're marching, you just have to accept that you're going to feel like you're off. You're on the wrong foot. Like every... You know, like oscillating between the right foot and the wrong, you know? Yeah, that too. Really that too. Um, now, what about when it comes to listening to bagpipe music? Do you, Who's your favorite, uh, like... Like, and I'm thinking, like, who's who's a band or individual that you've always loved listening to? And also, like, what's on rotation right now? What's got you excited? What have you been listening to lately? Mm, I've always enjoyed listening to... Well, the band is not together anymore, but uh, there was a band out of the Maritimes called Slancheva, um, with John McPhee, and before that, their piper was Bruce McPhee, but just, like, a phenomenal blend of sort of modern bass but with very celtic fiddle very traditional piping tunes but not well traditional celtic tunes but not necessarily specific to the pipes like they would take Mm. some of the other trad tunes like silver spear or things from like other instruments and adapt them onto the pipes Mm. um braybach does something in the same vein i'm really enjoying listening to them now um who else? E.J. Jones, I've gotten back into lately. I don't Have know you heard of him? E.J. Jones, no. He's he's in the U.S. I th- I want to say up. Eastern U.S., but I'm not sure. Um, there's like a oh, he makes them too. He makes them. There's like a bazooki in his trio band that he tours with. It's mm. yeah. Bazookies really, cool. really do sound great with pipes, don't they? They have got that kind it of a works. drony thing going on. It, really fits it well. works. Yeah. Plus, you have the absolute sustain, undying sustain of bagpipes compared with a string instrument that yeah. just naturally decays, right? What, what, what do you think there is about that, Jenna? Do you think that there's like a just like a setting in people's brains where like either they really love a drone versus they really don't so much? Like, because I feel like people who like bagpipes are really likely to really like other droney musics too. And by, by musics, I mean instruments, genres, pieces, etc. You know. I think you're onto something there. Yeah, and I've wondered about why bagpipes are such a polarizing instrument. Why do people absolutely love it or absolutely hate it? Mm-hmm. I think it's a combination of the drone and also people's tolerance for how reedy and how intense an instrument it is Mm, yeah what do you think yeah yeah and like that intensity can probably translate to volume and sometimes but maybe it's also something some other quality too that um it can maybe it gets overwhelming that there is a kind of sameness from tune to tune um and maybe that maybe that gets overwhelmingly boring i guess you know, like if you know it, if you know the instrument, and you know the music, you recognize the difference. You can get excited when it switches tunes. But, you know, for a lot of folks listening to an MSR, they couldn't tell you where it switched to a Strass Bay to a reel. You know, it's just all the same. Yeah. And especially when 90% of what people are hearing in live bagpipe settings, which is parades, right? Mm. Mass band tunes, they're in the same tempo yeah, that's They're true. It's like often in the same key. Yeah. The sameness goes to an extreme. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, another piper who's a real inspiration of mine, but she's not a Highland piper. She's a Gaita player. Oh, yeah. Um, Christina Pato. Yes. Oh, I listen to her too. I, I, yeah? Yeah, I think she's amazing. Absolutely. Uh, I get really excited about Gaita music. I, I, it's one of those things, just like Ilum piping, where like I want to do it, but like there is a cost barrier and... 
I'm almost scared yeah. to try because like, do I even have time at this point in my life? You know, <laughs> will I die before I get anything satisfactory out of them? But man, cool, cool music. Yeah. Plus the the time investment that it takes to get to like a comfortable enough place that you can just pick up the instrument and play for fun. Yeah, exactly. Yep. You know, I'm not saying I yeah. want to become like a world renowned guitar player. I just want to be able to like play it in a way that's satisfying to me where I can like make music. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, well, could I even get to that point before I die? I don't know if I could. And I imagine you're one of those people like me who's their own worst critic. So getting for it sure. to a satisfying point for you <laughs> takes a while, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Did you ever listen to that um, to that Chieftains album where they got together with some some gaita players, some traditional Spanish music players? Um, what was it called? Uh, Santiago, something to Santiago, Road to Santiago, or Road to Santiago? Was that like the that. album where they had like each track was from a different part of the world, a different type of collaboration? I bet that it, I bet that their work on this album came into that, but I think this one was like all with Spanish musicians, like it was like the chieftains do spain as it were okay it was, it was oh good. very cool here's the thing jenna i came across it by accident and this was that was actually kind of my intro to gaitas um i found the album in a bin at a at a like a goodwill and i was like oh a chieftains album i've never heard before and i actually got it to as a gift for a friend uh i was like oh i'll give it to you know i'll give it to zach it's his birthday coming up it's bagpipes you know it's the chieftains he'll like it and i popped it in the car to listen to it i was driving and i was very confused you know, I was like, like <laughs> Iberian Peninsula music, you know, I was like, I, I was expecting the British Isles, you know, like what's going on here. And at first it was just weird, but pretty quickly it like got into me, you know, like, and it's maybe my favorite Chieftains album personally that they ever did at this point, you know. Like, I really oh, like cool. It. Yeah, I'll definitely go give it a listen. Yeah, we're checking out something, something, something Santiago. I'd imagine if you Googled like Santiago Chieftains, it would come up somewhere. Yeah, I know I've seen the name somewhere. I think it's Road to Santiago. I think you're yeah, right. Yeah, you're probably right. So what about, um, do, you, do you have any kind of like pre-performance ritual that like if you were talking to your students and they were getting ready to go, like, go play their first funeral, what would be like some advice you might give to, to a piper in that kind of situation? Arrive early. Mm. <laughs> the advice. last thing you want is to be running late. <laughs> have you ever done that? I've showed up to a funeral late before and it still haunts me. Oh, if we start getting into comparing stories of things that have gone wrong <laughs> on gigs, like, oh yeah, there's a long list of stories there. Um, yeah, I've run late for funerals. I I nearly forgot my bagpipes to a gig once, but right. I did. I I realized in time to go get them and come back. Yeah. Um, I forgot my kilt hose for a gig once. That was interesting. Yeah. Different, but not as bad as forgetting your bagpipes. <laughs> it, well, what happened was, and I tell this to my students too, because I think it's important to normalize that stuff goes wrong. Yeah, for sure. You know what? It, I included, and I see other people freak out about nothing can go wrong. Well, you know what? It, it, it's going to go wrong at some point. So you mm -hmm. just accept it and you learn to roll with the punches, right? Yeah. Um. So this time that I forgot my kill toes, uh, there was no way, there were no spares around, there was no way I could go get any socks that looked remotely similar. So it was a gig with jackets, and I took my skin do and I cut the sleeves off of my dress shirt. What? <laughs> and those, yeah, so I was wearing brogues with no socks, and these kind of baggy looking sleeves <laughs> held up with flashes <laughs> and it? just sort of stuffed them into my brogues the best I could. <laughs> Did you go cuff side up or cuff side down? Cuff side up so that the cuffs folded over oh, the flashes sure. just yeah, like yeah. the top of the sock. Except the problem is they're not, the cuffs are not wide enough so you could see this V in the back where they split <laughs> and there's just this skin sticking out under the flash garter. Oh. <laughs> Horrible. That's but great. Like I'm logging that away just in case I'm ever in the same situation. <laughs> great pro tip, just in case. <laughs> and if anybody asks, you just say it's traditional, right? Traditional is it's somewhere, somewhere, you know. This is tradition. It's tradition. Yeah, it's a Denison tradition. There yes, many go. generations of my family have been doing this. Yeah. Still, probably better than like. There are probably some alternatives that could have been worse. So, that's. I, I think that's pretty impressive thinking on your feet, right there. Honestly. Yeah. 
Well, the, the one that haunts me the most was I, I got to a funeral gig on time, but I was only supposed to play for leading them out at the end of the ceremony. Mm. Um, and the ceremony ended a little ahead of time and I was downstairs tuning up. I missed uh, it. I oh, missed it. And so they, like, I felt... they walked out and you were still in the tuning room? Yeah. And oh, I, I found them in the reception hall after, and I, you know, you just feel horrible. Yeah. Um, it's not like so... you can redo it. You can't redo it, but you do what you can to make it right. You play some music, you, um, you know, make a, a little ceremony in the reception hall to substitute for it. And of course, I apologize profusely. And yeah. um, in that case, I just refused to take the payment for it because I, you know, just felt horrible. But the point is, you, you know, you do the best you can and it's good enough. Yeah. Yeah. You can't let something like that stop you from playing or anything like that. You got to keep going. Exactly. Yeah. What about you? Any, like, uh, just unexpected... I mean, drone reads falling in the bag is a classic one, of course. Oh, yeah. Classic. Yeah, the, I think probably the most painful for me was showing up late to a funeral. And, uh, mm. I mean, the, like, in my defense, I got a call for this funeral that day. You know, they're like, hey, you know, like... Do you have anybody? Because like I also farm work out to other pipers here locally. Like, do you have anybody who could get there in like two hours? And I was like, ah, geez, I'll do my best, you know. But yeah, I, I got there and it was like they were waiting for me, you know. And uh, so then it was like jump out of the car, get the pipes out, tune them as I'm walking across the cemetery toward them, you know. It's definitely uh, not as nice as I would have liked it to be. That's for sure. I have a friend who says he threw up into his bagpipes once. Oh. I don't know if it's totally true. Maybe he just like had a little bit of those gurglies and managed to swallow back down or something. But the way he told it, it, sounded, it was like he threw up into his bagpipes, but they still worked. So he played through to the end. And Oh. Yeah. Oh. oh. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't ask for details, right? <laughs> Tell me more seasoning. about it. <laughs> yeah, it's just seasoning. Yeah, it's called seasoning. Uh, do, you, do you have time to still nerd out about equipment with me, Jenna? Tell me about what, what stuff you play. I, yeah, I absolutely. I've been keeping it for a minute, but I, I would I would love to hear like what kind of what kind of pipes do you have? What kind of drones do you use? What about your small pipes? Your whistles? Tell me all about what you got, and also what do you dream of getting to? Hmm. So I play a set by a little known maker named Ed Barnes. Uh, again, this is the Sweet Sixteen I got set as I got as a Sweet Sixteen present as a teenager. Um, he, the Pipe maker was living in Montreal at the time. Now he works with another maker, and they're called McKay Barnes, uh, I think in Kingston, Ontario. Mm. So I play pipes by him. Uh, I use e easy drone reeds, you know, um, nothing fancy. Tried testing and true, and I like the sound of them. I was just talking to my buddy Swan just yesterday, and he was telling me, like, uh, he was at Winter Storm uh, a few weeks ago. Oh, cool. A lot of the top players there, they pop their stuff open. It sounds like a lot of people have some something else going on with the bass, but a lot of them have Easy Drone tenors at least, if not a full set of Easy Drones. Now, there's mm. no shame in using Easy Drones. It sounds like it's right up to the right up to the top of the top using Easy Drones. I mean, they sound good. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, I, I got to get to Winter Storm someday. Yeah, me too. It looks like so much fun. Yeah. So, what else... Yeah, what else? Um, uh, uh, chanter, favorite chanter reads. We don't want to be throwing any makers under the bus, of course. They're all good. But what do you play most of the time? And tell me about your small pipes and stuff, too. Well, I've really never found a chanter read I didn't like. Mm -hmm. um, I really haven't bought the same one twice. I, uh, I've tried anything from McPhee to Husk to um, Warnock to... Uh, I'm using a platinum right now with my band mm -hmm. um, McClellan, I think we're playing with the other band right mm -hmm. now. Um, they're all good. Yeah, I've really been happy with everything that I've tried. Um, Sound Supreme is kind of a go-to for me because they run a little on the easy side and I like an easier read. Mm -hmm. um, what is, else? I've is, got a... is Montreal like up pretty high above sea level or... I mean, you're, you're getting, not, you're not like right on the coast, but you're getting toward, you know, you're sloping off toward the east there. Is it down, down reasonably lower is up so high that it causes you problems with your chanters and your reeds? No, it's, uh, it's not high. It's not right at sea level, but it's, it's pretty low. Do gotcha. you, do you have trouble with elevation? Have you noticed that? Yeah, for sure. The, um, the, like the elevation chanter that, uh, that, uh, 
That is McClellan, right? McClellan Elevation Chanter, I think that's right. McCle I've got one right here, so I should know right off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, that has been kind of a, a helpful thing lately. Um, yeah, that's that's actually part of the reason that I started working with that chanter that I've been working on that, that has like the high B and stuff like that, but it also has some accidental holes built into it. Um, mm. Look, I'm gonna I am gonna get in serious trouble if I don't if I don't say the right maker for the elevation chanter. Holy moly! Why can't m my mind goes blank sometimes? You know what I mean? Yeah, it is. McClellan. You can edit okay. this out. Just go look it up. Yeah, come I have back. All the, I have we'll all cut. the power. I can do that. It is McClellan. That's right. <laughs> Basically, it's like a shift in the in the where the G is positioned. It's like up here we can't we, high G is like the main problem. Like you just you can't get it. You, we, you can't get a high G to sound properly. Like you get a chanter and you have to immediately carve the high G hole down lower or just accept that it's going to be like nine tenths of the way covered with tape, no matter what, if you want to get it close to in tune. So. Interesting. And cross fingering doesn't work at all. You can't get a cross finger for cross fingering thing to work for like a C natural or anything like that. Oh, huh. So I've always had trouble with getting my high G's to be flat enough too, but I don't like, I don't attribute it to elevation. I just thought it was just an issue yeah. for everybody. Oh, maybe it is. Let's see. What's the what is the elevation in Scotland? Of course, it's going to change in the Highlands, right? Lowest point, of course, is at zero. Highest point is uh, about four thousand feet. It gets high. I'm oh, just yeah. thinking, like, where 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 are these chanters being manufactured? You know what I mean? Like, if they're being manufactured at, you know, a thousand a thousand feet above sea level or lower. And then I take them up here to 5,500, you know, 6,000 feet above sea level up here. I, I figured that was part of it, but maybe it's not. So, uh, Piper, I was chatting with, suggested opening up the staple a touch with a new reed to uh, get that high G a little flatter and to get the, also the false fingerings to be more in tune. Really? Have you experimented with that? No, but it's, uh, I've got a whole pile of reeds here, so I for, for sure will. Which you, do you usually, do you think you'd just put like some needle nose pliers up inside there to, and just like kind of spread it a little bit to get it open a little? Mm, I think needle nose pliers would be too wide, but if you get an awl or what else? Yeah, something narrower than needle yeah, nose. Something that could get in there in the first place, right? Yeah. Or maybe yeah. like, maybe some electronics pliers that, you know, that are going to be smaller. Something I can get up in there and just open it up, huh? Yeah, exactly. Because like I mess with the wood, of course, but I've never even thought to touch the staple. Yeah. Have yeah. I got well, the I haven't... of a read right in my head? The staple's the metal tube, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and I haven't tried it myself. I've just heard that, again, one of those dark magic things that nobody really understands why, but it seems to work. Hmm. I'm gonna give it a try. Not only do I have a bunch of new reads, I also like never get rid of a read because I figure they might resuscitate. So <laughs> yeah, I've got a they lot do. Of that I can play with. Yeah. Well, they totally do. I've noticed if a read is absolutely croaky dying i put it in a box for at least a month let it dry out thoroughly and it seems to come back it won't live as long the second time around but i swear they come back oh yeah i think they do and, and i've got an outlier right now in my chanter that's a g1 platinum that its second life has been longer than its first life i don't know how long it was sitting but it's actually that's doing amazing. better this time <laughs> that's amazing yeah if only they all would huh great better better return on investment <laughs> Uh, what else? What what kind of? I know I see you playing small pipes. What kind of small pipes do you play? Yeah, I've got some Walsh uh, D, just plastic small pipes. I play um, Walsh as well. I like them. I think they play really good. I do too. Uh, I think for the money, they sound great too. Like they're very, really warm and stuff. You know. That's it, and the volume level. Like something I'm really struggling with is trying to find pipes that are at just the right volume level for just specific occasions like if you're playing in a room of 50 people then the d the these walsh small pipes work perfectly if you're playing with acoustic instruments with a singer perfect but let's say i want to play for a room of 100 150 people i don't want to blow them out of the water with highland pipes mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. i want something that's going to cut through maybe you know 90 decibels of conversation room of yeah. conversation noise in a big restaurant so mm, what do you think any uh pipe recommendations well there's there's the uh there's the um there's the border pipes right the yeah it's a kind of an in-between thing i don't have any myself though i do feel like for at least for me they've, they've been an acquired taste I've, i'm at a point now where like i love listening to them and i would love to have a set but for a while they were too harsh for me just like in general just like there was something about the 
the the sound itself i felt like it was kind of an unnecessary middle ground between nice gentle warm small pipes and brash uh highland pipes like well i say that brash sounds like a really negative thing i just mean like strong loud yeah highland pipes yeah i've come to where i really like them now so i don't know if they do well at gigs you know what i mean like for playing as a background instrument but um i also feel like I feel like those Walsh D pipes probably do have more cutting through power than like the lower to- the lower um, pitched pipes. I That's true. Do you, That's do true. You think, Jenna, do you think like you you are you you are of a somewhat diminutive stature? Do you, do you feel like like because I know like for me like I have like kind of sausage fingers they get in the way sometimes, and like I have had D chanters in the past, but like like I can't fit all my fingers on there very well. Like it gets really hard to play. Do you feel like you, you kind of have like a superpower in that you can play a chanter like that <laughs> cleanly where some humans like just can't do it. Like they can't squash their sausage fingers on there enough, you know, to get like good, good music out of it. Yeah. Well, that's how I lucked into buying these small pipes. Was Did somebody uh, get them and they couldn't play them? Yeah, that's, that's exactly awesome. what happened. Yeah. But I'm it's not, a perfect saying, fit for me. Like, I'm not saying that anybody should, like, subscribe. Like, there was that song, right? Like, short people got no reason to live, right? Like, I'm not saying anybody should sc- subscribe <laughs> to, like, the idea that, like, being tall is, is, like, better, right? But, you know, does it feel special when you do find it? Like, you know, maybe you go through your whole life never quite being able to reach the thing on the top shelf. You have to ask people for help or something like that. And, like, you come across this thing where it's like, I'm actually better at this than you guys because, <laughs> precisely because I'm small. You know what I mean? Does that feel great? <laughs> totally. Well, and especially when you when you go through like I don't know ten years of playing in bands, and it's all these like the stereotypical big guys, the military yeah. stereotype, and the Highland is, pipes like, reaching their shoulder. <laughs> yeah, totally. And the the Highland pipes, you know, the harder your read is, the tougher you are, yeah, and you just totally. tough through it. Yeah. Nah, nah. <laughs> That's not how it should be. So well. what else? I I do have a set of border pipes, actually. Oh, you do have um, some border pipes. Yeah, and what, what are they pitched at? Um, they're at A440. They're A oh, right pipes. On. Yeah, it's the struggle I have with those is their bellows blown. Yeah, and border pipe reeds are very sensitive to pressure, mm. so it's really hard. It's one of those sets of pipes where I just have to invest, you know, daily practice into it to get a satisfying, steady sound out of it. Yeah. Uh, I have modified them to play mouth blown, but the reed isn't made for that much humidity, and it just doesn't last long. Oh yeah. Uh, do, you, do you remember who made them? Um, I bought these used, and there's no maker stamp on oh, them. Oh, interesting. So it's a mystery. I think they might also be Walsh, but I'm not sure. Oh, right on. And what else do you have? Other? Do you have any other pipes there? There at your place right now, or or whistles, or anything else like that? I've got a few whistles that I just dabble in. I wouldn't perform with it per se, but mm-hmm. if I need to do a little bit of backup and whistle is appropriate, I'll break them out. I also bought a melodica oh, a couple cool. years yeah. ago. <laughs> yeah, I meant I didn't have to learn all the buttons for accordion, but I could get that accordion sound yeah, and yeah. join in with anybody. It's a lot of fun. There was that artist, uh, John Baptiste. I don't know if you heard, if you ever heard yeah, that. He, he yeah. did that Stay Human album that was so great. I heard him talking about his melodica playing once and he said something like, like he was like a, you know, he's a great pianist. Like I think he went to Juilliard for piano performance and stuff like that. Right. Oh, wow. But he said that like he was jealous when he saw other instrument, other instrument players, like able to like walk around and kind of like groove while they were playing. And so he got a melodica and now he's like, you know, one of the best melodica players out there, you know, but that was his motivation for getting one. <laughs> totally. Well, that's one of the best things about bagpipes too, is you just take it to the park. Yeah. Just yeah. go anywhere with it. You don't have to pack yeah. up your grand piano. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> or your pipe organ for that matter, right? <laughs> hey, your Hammond. Which, though, like, so like, having worked there, do you, do you play a lot of pipe organ yourself? No, I took a couple of lessons just to sort of understand a bit more about how it works and the voicing and like the textures from it, but no, not really. Yeah. I never got the, the foot movements down per se. Yeah. Oh man. That's what slays me for sure. Yeah, I... you know, separate to make your foot do stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. No, give me a piano pedal any day. There you go. What <laughs> what what's your like dream bagpiping stuff? You know, like would you you are you looking like dreaming of the day when you can get a um uh oh shoot see this is my mind going blank again. Who is it who makes the really nice electronic chanter? Like the the Blair. Blair. Yeah, the, the Blair's chanter. yeah. Or or like some red pipes or or you want another set of border pipes or illin pipes? Like what's your dream thing? 
Oh, yeah. I've thought about getting a Blair. Yeah. That would be nice. A lot um, of your experimentation thing, I feel like, of course, you could put that to good use. Use it as a MIDI controller and stuff like that, you know? Exactly. Yeah. I'm interested in experimenting with adding filters and distorting the bagpipe sound, and the Blair would just work so perfectly for yeah. that. Um, but honestly, I think the first thing I'll get before that is another chanter, something, I don't know, I've kind of thought about getting a, maybe not a gaita, but some kind of chanter with some more extended range. Ilian pipes, Ilian pipes seem like a really good option, but again, the learning curve and all the different fingering, I don't know. Yeah. Well, listen, if I can get this, this extended range chanter of mine developed enough, I'll get you one, Jenna, because I'll need people to, to mess with it and to experiment, so... There'll be hey, at, least, when, at least that. Whenever you get those out, I'll be all over it. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Well, Jenna, you've given me an hour and a half of your time this weekend. It's very kind of you, and I do appreciate it. I I don't want you to put, like, I don't want to, like, put you under pressure to, like, go out on, like, something deep and and, and important or anything like that. But uh, is there anything else that, that feels like it ought to be talked about? And maybe that with in mind, like, bring us toward a graceful close. Okay, well, here's a philosophical debate. Nice light topic to end with. Okay. It's not going to be the trolley <laughs> problem, is it? Please don't leave us with that. <laughs> leave us all frustrated all weekend. <laughs> um, no, if, if you take like a, let's say a recording of a Blair, and you get into digital manipulation, if you're changing the notes or adding filters, like... Is a bagpipe still a bagpipe? Is it still bagpipe music at that point? When is it no longer... Mm, when is it synthetic? When does it become something new? You know what I mean? 